Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, today I'll be presenting about MLIR, uh, multi-level intermediate representation, uh, new compiler infrastructure, um, presenting in, uh, in TensorFlow. Um, and sort of just like an overview, this will be a, bit, a little bit different than some of the other training, TF training sessions as you know, most of them focus on how to better use TF technology, while here we're looking at something that is sort of still coming. So this is a little bit mo mostly forward looking as to things that you know, we want to do and where we're going. Uh, so as an overview for today, I'm going to start by giving an introduction, what is MLIR, sort of like a 50,000 view foot view of what it is, how it all fits together. Then look at you know, why are we developing an MLIR. Uh, so the idea there is to sort of show the past, where we came from, how we got to this point, to point to what we want to do in the future. Then we're going to look at two applications. One is the new TensorFlow to TensorFlow Lite converter. Uh, it's still in pre-alpha, uh, but definitely try it and give some feedback. And then we'll also look at the TF2X Lite bridge, um, looking at some of the forthcoming changes, and I'll walk through a small example there. OK, so let's start with the, 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 the main question. What is MLIR? And so some people have said, you know, it's a little bit of a Rorschach test. Uh, you can say you can do anything with MLIR, and everybody has a different opinion about what it is. Uh, so if we start from a high level, you know, TensorFlow's goal is it's an open source machine learning framework for everyone. Now, in the same way, MLIR, which stands for multi-level intermediate representation, and with the ML not representing machine learning for a change, uh, we're looking at like an open source program optimization framework for everyone. Now, the way I think about this is as MLIR as an abstraction building toolkit, and I'll show some examples what I mean by that, and as well as it's a reusable set of compiler uh, passes for, for these higher abstractions. So particularly with MLIR, we are targeting the analysis, program optimization, and code generation. Um, and so sort of with that very high level, I'm going to start with like why MLIR and sort of go to exactly the components of what it is. So when we started MLIR, initially, it was, we had a question. Well, we looked at the ML accelerators, and we saw, well, there is many, many, many accelerators coming forth. And we had the question, now, how do we support all these accelerators for all the given like, TensorFlow ops? And I mean, of course, TensorFlow should provide the best accelerator performance for our users. And so we want to see, you know, can we make that easier? So it started, MLIR started as an exploration of a different code, of a different approach to doing code generators for accelerators. So we started looking, by, looking at our existing code generator framework for accelerators, XLA. Now, XLA is one of the, our most advanced machine learning compilers. We have targets for CPU, GPU, TPU, and other backends. How can we increase the reuse between the CPU, GPU, and TPU backends? Well, at the moment, TPU backend doesn't use LVM. So that means we have more low-level components that need it there because we're not able to reuse some of the, the same facets or structures. The TPU backend is specialized for the best TPU performance. But because it's so specialized, there's less reuse with the CPU and GPU components. But also looking at these different backends, we notice different abstractions. The CPU and GPU and, and TPU do not share abstractions beyond the HLO level. So if you look at the different backends, you'll have different levels of support for different loop abstractions, as well as like stencil emitters between the two. This makes reusing code between the two more difficult. So furthermore, we have a lack of having actual abstractions between HLO and, for example, like TPU, LLO, or LVM, which results in big gaps. So you have effectively passes that are effectively one-shot compilers doing lowerings from very coarse grain ops to multiple lower level ops. It's like, well, okay, but if we want to support so many different TensorFlow ops on all these devices, you know, we must leverage as much shared infrastructure as possible. So we must find, a, we should find a way to try and unify these different backends and these abstractions to be able to reuse more of the passes, more of the generators. So then we go to our first question, like, well, you know, can we add a new abstraction to allow greater use? Is there some new abstractions that we can add? I mean, we thought yes, but I mean, I'll, you'll be saying like maybe um, because we haven't added them yet. But we're looking at it, one of our goals was to address some usability issues with the current stack. One of them was custom ops for accelerators. The other one was dynamic shapes. But now, assuming we had done this, what happens with the rest of the stack? Because I mean, the, the goal is still this is an end-to-end -end TensorFlow user experience that we are considering. 
Um, and so I sort of roughly sp split out the stack into multiple phases. You have TensorFlow, and we're doing optimizations on the TensorFlow graph. And this is specifically for targeting like TPU. Uh, we have the tf 2 xlay bridge that bridges between TensorFlow Ops to HLO. Then on HLO, we have different passes, device independent, device dependent. And then finally, we have in the back ends the emission from HLO to, in this case, TPU LLO, or in the case of CPU, GPU, LVM. And so what we have at the moment is TensorFlow can see the whole program, but it has no insight on the device. So TensorFlow does its optimizations, and then it has these parts which this will run on the device, this will run on XLA. XLA, on the other hand, has deep insight into devices. It knows all the different backends and it knows how to optimize it. But it can't change the TensorFlow graph. So XLA assumes as fixed all its inputs and the graph structure given to it by, by TensorFlow. This results in optimization barriers between the different passes. So a backend can't dictate to the bridge which HLO to produce. The HLO produced is constrained by what is in TensorFlow. And so this leads to things such as the double transpose trick, which allows people to force certain layouts. But such operations actually constrains a coupling between the different layers. Now the higher level layer and the lower level layer has an implicit coupling and fixed set of assumptions sort of hard coded. Beyond that, the tf 2 xlay bridge is bridging two different systems with a large impedance mismatch. TensorFlow side, we have the open op ecosystem, we have dynamic sizes, we have different types, we have stateful ops. XLA size, we have HLOs. HLOs are mostly side effect free, beyond a, a few uh, ops. You have different types, but it's a very different system that the bridge does in one pass transitions between. So at the moment, what we have is that this stack does not abstract out various functions. We have the top level technologies tied to the lower level hardware implementations. So this results in a large gap of abstractions between these layers, which make, makes the passes more difficult to write. Now, this is not something unique to machine learning or to TensorFlow or XLA. Uh, this similar kind of gap also led to domain specific IRs elsewhere. And in this particular case, in the compiler domain. Uh, if you look at like, the different inputs from languages such as Java, C++, Swift, Rust, and Julia, almost all of these languages that target LVM have introduced a new mid-level IR on which they can do their higher level optimizations. And actually, C++ does not do this. So Clang does not have this. Uh, and I, know, I have tried to admit this slide before, but then Chris stopped me. And he's very upset about the fact that there is no soul. Um, and so this is a very you know, dear point that we're missing a lot of optimizations and reuse by, by not having the soul. So what this has is, is this means this, we can do domain-specific optimizations. We can do progressive lowering. So we can actually have simpler hops between these different systems. And if we look at the TensorFlow one, we can consider, think of this as if you look at like the CPU GPU path, like the TF graph to XLA HLO as the HLO being this intermediate representation mid level between the TF graph and LVM. Well, domain specific IRs are great. High level domain specific, they allow high level domain specific optimizations. This progressive lowering actually encourages reuse between the different levels because you can have smaller passes doing dedicated things. It's great. It, it's great for location traffic. Uh, this enables some flow sensitive of type checking, so you can operate on higher level semantically meaningful parts and produce uh, uh, verification at that level. The part that's not so great. It's a huge expense to build this infrastructure. Uh, you're doing a re-implementation of all the same stuff, pass managers, location tracking, use of change, inlining, all of these things. And more importantly, innovations in one community doesn't benefit the other communities. So that's sort of a downside to having these domain-specific IRs. And if we look at the TensorFlow compiler ecosystem, the previous graph is very much simplified because the real situation is, from a TensorFlow graph, we have multiple different backends and multiple different IRs that it's being generated from. From a graph, we generate HLO, TensorRT has an output, there's an ngGraph, CoreML, TensorFlow Lite, so many different graph IRs, each with different challenges. So in a lot of these bridges, we have similar but different technologies. And this is not going away anytime soon. But this results in a fragile, poor user experience when failures happen. 
the location tracking between these different phases are, are variable. So in some cases, there's no location propagated through. So if an error occurs, the only thing you know about is what happens at the lower level without being able to trace it back. Beyond this, this also leads to duplication of infrastructure at all levels. We are re-implementing the same infrastructure multiple times. This is true even in TensorFlow today. We have the same optimizations at both the TensorFlow and HLO level. And so in some cases, you have the optimization paths that you actually redo multiple times. Um, and, and in some other cases, you, you have future paths that actually ignores the results of previous ones. So as an example, we do layout analysis and assignment on TensorFlow graphs using Grappler. But when we get to HLO, these are mostly ignored. Sometimes for good reasons, because HLO XLA actually knows better about the device it's targeting. And sometimes it's unfortunate, because that actually would have been a good decision given the higher level graph structure. And, but beyond that, we need to actually duplicate these passes, because we cannot represent the, the same operations in one uniform way. And a, an unfortunate side effect of this is we actually end up transforming multiple times back and forth between equivalent representations. So for example, in one unit test, we converted from, from graph to graph def seven times, from graph def to graph four times, and then once to HLO. And I mean, this, this is, in a way, not useful transformations. But our problem is we are unable to represent all of these different ops and structures together. So we need to duplicate this. So with that, the, the goal of MLIR is to enable global improvement to TensorFlow infrastructure. Uh, it's an SSA-based design to generalize and improve ML graphs. Uh, we want to add better side effect modeling, control for representation, improve the generality of the lowering passes, which I'll spend time on in the applications, focus on dramatically increasing the code reuse between all these distinct paths, fix the location tracking, and other pervasive issues for better user experience. So that when a, when a user, when a failure occurs, the traceability and the debuggability is greatly improved. And at the moment, we believe there's no reasonable existing answers, and we refuse to copy and paste another SSA Bay optimizer six more times. And so that sort of led us to MLIR. Um, a couple of the other goals is, well, we want to embrace TensorFlow. TensorFlow is the, one of our, our main targets. We don't want to work around it. We want to support the full generality of TF graphs. We want to allow the aggressive reuse of infra across multiple hardware paths. And similar to TensorFlow, we want to allow open customization. We want to have a target be able to say, implement my JPEG uh, decoder using this block. We want the user to be able to say, hey, I actually have a custom kernel. For this model I'm running, I want to see its performance, so use my kernel. Beyond that, we want to be, enable folks to experiment with their own lower level implementations of operations. So, if the compiler is not there yet, or the researcher has a better idea, or we have an ML algorithm generating code, we want to be able to plug that into the same system and see the effect on an end-to-end -end behavior. But we also want to embrace the limitations of particular backends. So for example, if your backend only supports convolution, we only want to provide convolution. If you don't support control flow, well, we don't give you control flow. If you have, only have static shapes, we only can give you graphs of static shapes, etc. Um, this includes things as uh, what floating point precision operations you, uh, you support, force quantization, things like that. We want to avoid the big semantic gaps in lowering. We do not want to have these big gaps where you have one step to the next in the transformation paths, which have, are bridging completely separate systems, which are difficult to debug and, in, uh, and, um, and verify. And then very importantly, we want to improve the traceability and testability for users. So if your model fails compilation, we want to be able to point back to where it failed. And so with this, what should MLIR provide? Well, it should represent multiple levels of abstraction. We should allow this progressive lowering. So within a given function, having a progressive set of lowerings that gets you to the destination, it should not be these big jumps on two separate data structures. We want to be able to lower through multiple different abstractions. This also means that the passes need to be designed to operate on these different levels and properties rather than looking at fixed ops. And I mean, I think this is especially essential for like TensorFlow, which has an open ecosystem, which 
and with ops being added very, very regularly at a good pace. Um, we also should make it easy to add abstractions or domain-specific IR constructs. An example here is we have the affine uh, dialect. In our affine dialect, we have affine loops. This isn't a hard-coded construct in MLIR. An affine loop, which can be used for some polyhedral code optimization, is something that is extended. It's the dialect itself adds it. Beyond that, we're looking at location as a first class construct. Locations are intrinsically tied to operations and optimizations. You cannot create an op without a location. If you're doing a transformation, and you're replacing with a new op, you have to specify where this op comes from. So this means we have a path. Hmm? What do you mean by location? So location in this case could be either like file, uh, file location, could be name, could be stack trace. So we have a couple of different locations, and, it, uh, one of the, and we actually also have like an opaque location that is just interpretable by a dialect, for example. So if your backend has a different concept, the most common ones for TensorFlow is the a name location corresponding to like the name in the graph def, or like the Python call, call stack. So the set of calls that got you to creating this op. Uh, Another part we also want to work on is we want to have this framework enable us to ha complete this a patchwork of tools. So at the moment, we've run into a couple of users have run into a problem where we have broken paths. You have a tool A that gets you from representation X to Y, and you have a tool B that gets you from Y prime to Z. But if you actually want to get from X to Z, you have to do something else or you have to restrict your model. We want to try and get a path to complete this patchwork and enable like end-to-end -end workflows of interest. OK, so where are, and so this is sort of like, where are we applying MLR? So most have been talking about like the infra. The first application is the TensorFlow TensorFlow Lite Converter. Uh, this is something which, uh, w you know, is going to, like I said, is pre-alpha, I'll discuss next. And it's working for a couple of models. We have a couple of new features coming in there that en enable some new TensorFlow Lite features. The other target we're working with and adjacent is like TensorFlow to XLA Bridge, you know, looking at the current lowering to XLA as well as accelerators. Uh, we're working with the Grappler team on graph optimizations, shape inference, device partitioning, and placement. And then we also have the TPU and GPU cogen projects going on to evaluate new approaches to generate code for these different devices. So I think of sort of, of MLIR as like three different parts. One, you have the graph compiler which is like the op expansions, the lowering to TF Lite, auto outside compilation, parallelism, sharding. That's sort of the target. Code generator, which focuses on like higher level abstractions for like code generations. And so there's like polyhedral loopness, tile tensor views to this nature. And underlying all of this is sort of the MLIR infrastructure. So this is framework independent IR. Uh, you have rewrite generators like automatic pattern matchers, the mechanisms to define dialects consisting of like types and ops, and that sort of ties all of this together. And that sort of leads me to like one of our first applications, which is the TensorFlow Lite Converter. So the basic flow for a TensorFlow Lite Converter is uh, TensorFlow Graph as input, and here I'm using Graph, um, misusing it slightly because it could be a graph, it could be like from a Python script invocation, save model. But the goal is to translate it from this representation to uh, the MLIR module consisting of ops in the TF and TF executor dialect, which I'll come to in a second, to legalize from TF to TensorFlow Lite. And now legalize is sort of just a different word of saying like convert. Convert all the ops in TensorFlow to TensorFlow Lite ops that are legal. And so the reason sort of we, we use legalize here is we don't necessarily convert, need to convert all the ops. For example, TensorFlow Lite supports flex ops, it supports custom ops. So some ops may actually remain in the TensorFlow dialect. Then beyond that, we have some optimizations and then translating it back out to the TensorFlow Lite flat buffer. So the converter is to change from the two different graph representations. We have two different runtimes, TensorFlow and TensorFlow Lite. They have different constraints and targets. Uh, but the, the graphs we want users to run, that they trained and run, want to be the same. And so we have like this converter workflow. Uh, the converter actually has an overlapping goals of regular compilation. 
uh, because I mean, edge devices can also have accelerators. And beyond that, I think of TensorFlow Lite in a way with this converter as just a weird ISA. So you have a weird instruction set that you're targeting, but it's, it's still a compiler problem. Now, MLIR's pluggable uh, type and rewrite system simplifies specifying these transforms and expressing what you need to do to convert between these ops. And as an example here, we have the quantize type is a first class citizen in the TensorFlow Lite dialect. So we have the quantized op, op representation. So it's not just a U and 8, but it's actually, you can say it's a uniform quantized with these parameters, which allows for some additional checking and verification. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the focuses is usability. Now, usability is one of Toco's top complaints among TF Lite users, checking on errors, unsupported cases, confusing error messages. And this is one of the things we want to improve. One of the ways we want to improve it is making the debugging easier. We want the locations to point back to your source. So when an error is em emitted, we want to point back to the TensorFlow graph or TensorFlow Python that caused the error. And for this, we're building on and extending the TF debug info work currently ongoing. Um, and we want to track the location origin of instructions as well. So for example, if you have a fuse multiply add, then it has a fuse location corresponding to both the multiply and the add. So it shows you this new op was created from these previous ops. And that allows you to track back to the original code. After that, we also actually want to be able to say why a model failed to convert. So we want to point to the unsupported option types. We also want to say how those types came to be. Oftentimes, the user gets a failure, and they have no idea why this op isn't supported, because they, didn't, in some cases, didn't even mean to have this op there. And so we want to be able to make it easy to, to find out why it got to a model failing. And as I mentioned, we have dialect types to enable more checking and better reporting. So now we can have things that say, oh, you have an ad with two non-conforming quantized types. I'm sorry, this ad won't work. Instead of having it as uint and fail at runtime, we can do the checking at compile time. And so if I, to give an example, if you look at the old Toko experience for having an unsuspected value for an attribute, you get a check failure. Uh, and the check failure will point you to a, a stack trace somewhere. Um, and we want to go from that to where we are today, where we specify, like, hey, this node failed to convert because a TF conf 2D actually requires a data format attribute to be either NHWC or NCHW. And this op was inserted by this following call in bet from like your libraries and from your user code and libraries in between. And this allows the user to go find uh, where the error occurred. And I'll mention this output is also involving. Uh, if you try it today, you'll actually see carrots pointing to the errors, as you would see with Clan compilation errors. So if source code interleaved as long as it's in the same working space. Um, and so the idea is to, to make the user experience much easier for debugging these errors. The next application is the, the new TensorFlow compiler bridge. Uh, so at the moment, we are, the TFT-XLA bridge is an interop between TensorFlow and XLA. It consists of rewrite passes as well as transformations to XLA. Now, XLA also targets from multi-node machines to edge devices. So it's actually not as distinct from TensorFlow Lite. And so also, the paths we use to load to these two different backends should not be as distinct. We should be able to reuse them as new features become available in one. The other ones should be able to take advantage of that. And I'll actually mention that I want to get rid of the word bridge here, because one of our goals is, n is not to have this big span between different abstractions. We want to have this more progressive with shorter, lowering steps that are individually testable. And beyond that, we, we, we don't want it to be just XLA-specific, you know, looking at like custom compiler backends. We want to make it easy for other compiler frameworks to integrate into TensorFlow in a unified way. So the dialect the compilers can have their own dialect, for example. Dialects can integrate in the same framework. You define your operations and types. And you can have the pattern to rewrite specifying the transformations you need to target your backend. Um, and it also means that 
Custom pipelines can reuse the existing components. We want to be able, we want to make reusing the pipeline as easy as possible. So MLIR, one of the goals is to be a reusable set of compiler passes. Um, and so one of those is to translate from TensorFlow or the XLA dialect to your dialect. And so folks then have the option of saying, what ops are legal in the dialect? Um, and then, of course, we. Throughout all of this, we want to be able to optimize the graph and make it easier for the backends to focus on the parts that are important to them. I'll give a little example of the current versus the new approach, like at the end of the, the, the TensorFlow, TF2XLA, for converting a TensorFlow op to XLA op. Um, and so, taking ReLU6 as an example. So, we have ReLU6. You define it using a class. You register it on an XLA op. You add this. This op is an XLA op kernel, which actually derives from the TensorFlow op kernel. Uh, inside of it, it uses XLA op kernel context and set outputs, set inputs, uh, as is very familiar to folks adding new TensorFlow ops. One of the differences here is that this is actually constructing an XLA expression. This XLA expression is something that is built in a, in a side data structure captured by the context. And the outputs set here are actually the values flowing through the graph are tensors containing pointers to this, uh, this, this, this XLA expression. So what you have here is actually a pointer being fed into the output of this op and flowing through the TensorFlow graph. But like you can represent it, and you know it's it's very familiar, I think, to folks to how to do this. And I think that's one of the problems because it's so complicated. That means if something goes wrong, it's difficult to find out what went wrong. And so the moment we're testing this at the moment is by you're writing Python tests. So for example, if to test ReLU6, we have a unary op test that derives from XLA test classes, and so we have an end-to-end -end test case starting from TensorFlow and ending on execution on different devices. So per floating point type, per device, we execute ReLU6 on both, both compiled and both using TensorFlow. So we're testing, testing runtime values for different types on different devices and checking approximate quality. But very important here, it's actually you have to construct this test to avoid all the optimizers along the way. So one of my favorite examples was I was once debugging uh, why our presubmit was taking so long. And looking at the longest running test, actually found out it was a no-op because it was being constant propagated away, and we were just testing constant folding over and over and over again instead of actually running anything. Um, so it, it can be very difficult to ensure that the test you think you're writing is actually the one you're writing. And so, and another point is this is testing the NN ops ReLU6. Um, this, uh, in this case, it, it actually corresponds to a TensorFlow op. But when I talk about TensorFlow ops later, I'm referring to the ops as registered as by register op, uh, op registration, so the C++ ops um, versus the Python constructs. Anyway, uh, so the current approach in the TF2 XLA bridge is it's a symbolic execution of the TF graph using the executor. We're storing pointers to a side data structure in tensors flowing through the graph. We capture the XLA type in tensors at, in different uh, data structures depending on the type, TensorFlow type flowing through the graph. We're mostly using end to end tests using Python for constructing it as this is the easiest way and this works, you know, it allows for very complicated tests. But we need to, to thread these test cases pass ON optimizers to actually ensure they work. Now, the new approach we want to have here is we want to ma make it so that you can write the directed unit tests simply. In MLIR, the source of truth for the uh, operations is the IR. The IR is round trippable through textual form, which means you can take an IR, run optimization pass, and dump it. And that's exactly what you would have gotten in the in-memory changes. Beyond that, we want to ensure that there's no optimization run beyond what the de developer specified. We want the types to be representable in the IR itself and in one way. There should not be a confusion as to what type is represented, where, and what it is. Uh, and also, we want to enable having these multiple abstractions 
to lower without having large jumps between the different systems. And so just to plug it at the start, uh, and this slide is actually out, out of date, but so we have MLIR opt and equivalently like TF opt, which are like optimization tools similar to LVM's opt tool. It's a tool for testing compiler passes. Effectively what you have is you have IR as input, you run MLIR opt specifying an exact pass, and you get IR out again. So textual in and textual out. This allows for pretty cheap verification of the output because you're verifying the transformation. You're verifying your sh the structure of the transformation. So you do not need to actually run it on different devices if you just want to verify the transformation. You do not need to compute values. You're verifying the structure. And so in this case, if you look at like the TF Radio 6 example, um, you can create a test case using MLIR Translate, which is another tool that goes from a TF graph into like MLIR. Or you can manually write it if you enjoy writing SSA-based IRs, uh, textual form. So here is an example of a function that takes as input a tensor of a fixed shape. This is actually corresponding to the previous example. And I'm not going to get into details, but you can see the uh, TF dialect RFC for more information about the two different dialects. But here we have the TF executor dialect uh, consisting of like the graph and an island within it. Within the island, you have uh, the ops in the TF dialect. And so in this case, you have the radio 6 operation with the, the normal attributes of like T, device, and name, taking in a tensor of 1 times 3 times F32 and producing the same one again, which gets yielded. Now, from this, we can actually convert it to the TF dialect simply because in this case, we have a single island due to no control dependencies and no side effect ops. And so this is the pure TF dialect representation of this where we don't actually need an island for this. Uh, and you'll see like a single radio 6 operation. But you'll also actually see like duplicate information stored here because now we have the explicit types. And so with the explicit types, we can actually get rid of like all these different attributes for like T and the mapping from T is the result type, all of this, because we have the types. So these are derived attributes from the op itself with the type being the, the source of truth for them. And so in the import and export between like graph devs uh, and node devs, we can use this information and derive it from the ops. And so you can have this simpler form uh, to just specify like the op and the result type. And then from here, Oh, and well, one thing you might have noticed in the previous slide, I actually elided the names as well along with the attributes. And that's because all ops have, have locations. And from TensorFlow, one of the most common ones is the name as used as location. If you have the debug info, you can also use the call stack if that information is provided. And so locations for ops are optionally pr printed. And so like in this case, if we actually print the op as well, you can see like the original name as from the import as well. Now, names are one location, file line is another, and then call stacks another. And then, so for example, if you look at like the fused ones, and this is for from one of the other examples, you, you can get like the location of this op was actually due to a fusing of a ReLU, a bias add, a convolution, and this constant op B. And now you have this single op, that's its location. You can trace back how you got to that op. And now if you want to lower to from TF ops to XLA ops, uh, well, uh, we also have, a, uh, so in, in, previously as shown, we have the TF dialect to match the TF ops. So these are like ops defined via like register ops. And so this I differentiate from like the, the Python ops. And similarly, we also have an XLA dialect with ops to match HLOs. Mm. Converting between these two, we have you can use a general legalization framework. So this framework is a general graph to graph rewriting structure. And for example, we have patterns. So you have to specify patterns that go from a source stack to a destination stack. So in this case, convert from a TF radio 6 op that is a tensor of one of those types. If that's true, then convert it to an XLA clamp op with between 0 and 6 an input. So the XLA clamp op uh, has its first argument min, then argument, then max. What these are, are like, these are declarative rules. They are effectively a statement of equality under conditions that we can use to uh, optimize for a given target dialect. 
And these rules actually also allow for dynamic constraints. So you can say, only fire this rule if the following is true. And that allows you to specialize the rules for like certain cross models, certain backends, all these kinds of things. But with that rule added into the system, we can run TF opt again with dash XLA legalize. And now, from our previous input, we now get this as output. So now you have a very directed change from like, the, the TF radio 6 to the XLA clamp with two extra constant ops added in the function. Um, and of course, backends can find different lowerings, but this just means like this transformation to clamp now is a, is a simple transfer, is a, can be simply verified textually. No execution is needed, no explicit values need to be verified. The verification of the correct execution of the different ops can now be done independently of the verification of the transformation. But like, if you wanted to change the way clamp, the way this pattern is implemented to go from a single clamp to like two clamps, mm -hmm. if it's like one for zero and one for six, for example, sure. that would like break all your unit tests, but it would still be correct. Correct, yes. Yes. So I mean, it's- I'm not worried about that. I mean, but then you, so it's a question of like, if, um, I, I'm not, no, because yeah. I mean, that's what I'm verifying at the moment is, is the transformation. And you're saying, well, I can get the same equivalent numerical result by multiple different transformations. And if someone one day changes one, a lot of tests are going to break. That's, but you should not be verifying this transformation, depending on where you verify this, yes. OK. OK. Um, and so what I did not show here and, uh, was also like, how we auto-generate C++ classes for these operations with helper functions. So in this case, for example, the XLA op, clamp op in C++ actually has uh, accessors such as min, operand, and max. So you don't have to specify like get operand free. Uh, we also generate docs from the same, same from one description. So we actually have a, you know one description format, and from which we generate like the exporting to graphdev, TF live flat buffer, XLA protos. Uh, all the ops defined in MLR, you can specify verifications for the ops, as well as structural verifications for regions and functions, which means you can capture the ops and their invariants together. You can verify graphs after every step of every transformation if you want to, so you can narrow down failure cases. Uh, it also means that passes can actually assume valid graphs. Uh, so that you operate on a valid graph without having to repeat the same pattern everywhere to be defensive. I uh, also didn't actually speak a lot about the, the pluggable type system and the code generation. And so a lot of these, you know, in future when we actually have you know, more examples and more time, you know, we can definitely go into more of these. Um, but that is sort of just like a whirlwind tour for one of the, the applications we're looking at. Um, and so sort of as in conclusion, you know, um, MLR is a new compiler infrastructure to unify graph and code gen for TensorFlow. Uh, we're looking at for multiple representing multiple levels of abstractions and ops from different dialects coexisting and op being optimized together. Uh, we want to enable progressive lowering in a testable and verifiable manner, making it easier to add these test verifying behavior. And beyond that, we want we to make this the infrastructure as un un unopinionated as possible. We want to be able to get out of the way of the developer and enable them to define their own abstractions for targeting their use cases and their backends. OK. With that, I want to say thanks, everybody, and open for questions. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to riff on this word, unopinionated. No, Do you have an opinion on memory safety for MLIR dialects? OK, that is a broad question. Yeah. I, so I can imagine, in the sense of progressive lowering, about wanting to lower to a dialect that uses raw pointers instead mm -hmm. of uh, uh, symbolic handles to yes. tensors. Um, is there expected to be any infrastructure that will talk about safe and unsafe regions and programs? Because if we're shipping them around to people, mm -hmm. it would be unfortunate if this became a vector for. Uh, yes. So I, I think I, I can sort of add, add a question even upwards. I mean, I think a, a, an even simpler case is if you think about like numerical equivalence of transformations. Right, so a case where we have one op that has certain um, NAND behavior and sort of trapping behavior, converting it to a different dialect which has either perhaps none of that. So, for example, let's say we go to a dialect which says, well, you know, fast math is fine. 
you know, so all the optimizations, division by zero never happens, so you can always, you know, do an invert and multiply. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that boils down to the, like, the rules you do to do the transformations for where you're heading uh, needs to be aware of that. So, I mean, if you're lowering to a different dialect which has, like, less guarantees, I think that is up to, um, you know, the, direct, the, legal, the, the legality of the end to determine that, right? So meaning like the memory safety verification, I feel like in the dialect where it's safe, we have to insert all the verification and whatnot. If we're going towards the dialect which is unsafe, we have one or two options. Either insert runtime checks to do the verification and any extra um, sanitization and elide them where we know it's possible. Or we have to say, well, now it's unsafe and sorry, you're, you're taking an unsafe input. Uh, I mean, the, yeah, no, I, I haven't thought about this much, but that's, uh, yeah, well, and I will say, I mean, it, it's going to be more fun as we start playing with this. And so, I mean, I encourage folks to start pushing and prodding in it and filing bugs. Um, I mean, at the moment, it's very much, you know, infrastructure that's, you know, probably not in your use, usage path today. Um, but, you know, uh, we, we, we want to make it, uh, useful that and the uh, anyway yeah, and the button to and this will be in TensorFlow GitHub repo later today. Uh, like everything will be open, uh, so everything is in the the TF and TF control flow dialects. TF control flow dialects, XLA, Excellent. TF light, yeah. Cool. And there's also going to be open design meetings. For so can, can you can you point us? That? Sorry. Yeah. Quick quick question here. Quick question. C can you share like a simple example uh, of, I don't know, like TensorFlow with fully connected layer and then that we can go like step by step, for example, converting it to MLIR, then you describe like optimization step and then like converting it to LLO, HLO, all the steps. I just want mm -hmm. to like dive deeper and learn. learn sure. more. Do you have this kind of end-to-end -end example, like not just when I just run a command line and run convert, and then it's sure, converted. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I want to see intermediate data too. Yes. And so you can actually do this by, and I don't have an example offhand to, sh to show you, but we, in, in our testing directory, you'll see a couple that does some of these manually. But effectively, what you can do here is you, you, can, um, you can link together multiple phases of like MLIR translate piping into an MLIR op, piping into an MLIR op, piping into an MLIR translate to see like all these phases. I mean, actually, you, you can specify MLIR op with multiple different passes one after the other, and then a translate at the end. And if you like want to see all the intermediate data, just slap in T in between. Um, I actually do have an example from a TF Lite hackathon, but I do not have that slide handy, because I think that's actually one of the things that is quite nice. You can see like every step as you're progressively changing things and running different passes. And is it uh, covering uh, mobile devices like a uh, phone? Uh, well, I mean, our first use case is TF Lite. So Can I, I mean, run it on mobile phone? Oh, you mean running it on? Yeah, yeah, sounds good, yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, I want to run it everywhere, so. From <laughs> TensorFlow, right? Okay. Cool, cool, sounds good. Thank you.